tell you a story. Don't worry, it'll be quick. Although the memory of it may last with you a long time. And that's my hope, at least. I was going to take my girl for a ride in my new one-year-old car. I love the sound systems, you see, and it was time to spend some quality time. And when I went to pick her up, a few of her family members were there, including her mother. Everybody leaned closer to look, most of them smiling, when the mother said, Be careful now, you take care of my baby. You know I got her, she's mine too, ma'am, I answered, giving my telling smile, sincere looking because it was. Yeah, I do know you. Make sure you drive careful, she countered, not catching me off guard, but catching me even though I saw it coming. We all did and we all laughed. I waved and pulled away, but then, me being me, I continued to think it over in hindsight. The houses, cars, and people shrinking in that rear view. My baby's large brown eyes were preemptively at the side of my face and they stayed there. What you thinking about, Daddy? She knew it would be something interesting because she wanted me to share with her. I thought about the joke, her mother making sure that I kept her safe when there was nothing in my personal past or any of our past combined that would indicate otherwise. The funny thing about the joke is that I believed it myself in the moment that we all laughed. I got it. But then there was a reason that my laughter went uneasy, that my smile faltered in front of my daughter so that I had to play it off. You see, jokes are only funny when there is a basic underlying understanding, a premise that everybody can agree on. If someone tells a joke about something you have no experience or memory of, it's just not funny kind of like that you had to be there sort of thing it's hard for someone to get it if they weren't there in some way so I wondered why everyone there had found that funny why I felt uncomfortable the instant I thought about asking why is that funny or have you ever known me to put my daughter in danger surely the answer would have been something like oh lighten up or relax as in can't you take a joke Relax and take a joke at your unearned expense. So I took the joke in the moment and I took it with me down the road. Nothing, sweetheart. I almost forgot to answer her. She was still looking, by the way. It wasn't until later, the ride long over and my baby safely at home, that I sat alone, no eyes on me but my own. I grabbed the remote and I looked for some of the content creators that I follow. YouTube had to put their two cents in, of course, making me watch an 11 second commercial that felt like an eternity before I could watch what I had actually clicked on. The crazy thing is that it was that commercial that jarred my memory. It was then that it clicked. It was some show on a mainstream network. The scene was for an ongoing series. You know, the kind where industry writers from mainstream America, they make shows about black people or featuring black people. Stop me if you heard this one. A black man pulls up alongside a beautiful smiling sister and smiling dangerously at her, tells her to get in. While she ponders it, everybody looking knows it's not going to end well for her. She, you know, they show the parting close-up of his face, his dark eyes showing ahead of the thoughts behind them. It dawned on me that this was the memory that they had of me, the one that made her mother tell me to take care of my own daughter. In reverse language, it was to say to remind me not to cause damage to my own seed, as if that doesn't go without saying. You see, this is a memory that society shares of me. Anybody that watches popular media imagery, it is a false memory, of course, but a real one for all intents and purposes. It's the reason why I understood when her mother said what she said, why I got the joke and laughed along with them. The reason why I also knew it wasn't going to end well for the sister on the TV commercial 
when she got in that car. Because based on my past experience with popular media, I recalled already how it was going to end when she trusted a black man. They showed the horrible car crash by the end of the commercial, by the way. 11 seconds. Evil or incompetent, the takeaway is that the black man is inherently, intentionally or accidentally, the most dangerous thing smoking for a black woman and children. This is nothing new to say that media imagery creates false realities in the mind of the consumer, especially the passive consumer. I've done at least two videos that touch on this channel, that touch on the topic on this channel. But I guess this was a real manifestation of that, a false association that had been planted between my girl and myself, one in which I had essentially been accused of having the same history as a black man who crashed the woman in the commercial, an experience that had been virtually downloaded into all of our collective memories. It is the same memory that reminds the white people to watch me when I come into the store, though personally they've never known me to steal. They're reminded to follow and watch me for a few blocks, guns and sirens at the ready, because we have this collective memory of myself that I do bad things, that I'm suspect. It is a false memory of myself shown in the way that it went unspoken amongst all of us when my baby mama made the joke. But the thing about memories is that they don't exist in the past. The fact that they walk around in your brain with you means that they come to the present and we all know where that leads. The future depends on us to make, to censor, and otherwise abstain from the kind of media that creates false imaginations past, present, and future, especially when it comes to our young people. The thing that makes this important is that, like any false history, it can shape the perception of oneself, especially during vulnerable states of mind, like during childhood development, states of adult immaturity, or even when anyone is consuming media in a passive state of mind. Ideas about oneself and memories of oneself can come from actual lived experiences as an individual or they can come from perceived experience, experiences or group affiliation experiences. For example, when one's favorite sports team loses in some championship and all the fans go out and tear up the stadium or drink themselves even more silly, they say things like, we lost the championship when in reality, only the players on the field have the actual acute memories of playing and losing the game. Think about it. What makes the experiences, the memory, and feelings of loss so real for the observing fan? When these are people that can choose or not choose which teams they will follow, fair weather or not. The perceived empathy with the team itself the affinity level they feel with the team identity as otherwise exemplified through uniform colors and logos and other identity traits. Racial identity is one of such categories of shared experience. This is why when others of the racial group experience losses or gains, other members of the in-group have similar experiences of loss and gain. Like when a person perceived as black gets lynched on public television or wins the presidency, sparking feelings of anguish and euphoria in others of the same group. The thing about memories is that while they can be falsified, written and implanted for you, as I will show, they can nonetheless occupy the same space as reality in the mind of the person. For example, you have a bookshelf, right? And on that bookshelf, you place books that you yourself have written. And you also place books that you have come across, books written by others that captured your interest. These volumes of information will occupy the same space and time, that of the ever-expanding and heavier bookshelf. Some of the phrases being referenced by you upon demand, others you can't, you can't quite recall where they are buried in those multitudes of pages. In the case of a computer, 
there are files that you write for yourself and files that you download from other sources. Either way, these files, while initially going through a malware screening, if you're on guard, will ultimately wind up running in the background of your system. That is to say, occupying memory space. Studies show that when children play video games, for example, especially the more advanced first-person experiential games, their minds, on a subconscious level, have great difficulty distinguishing the virtual realities from the organic realities of the world around them. This is true while they're playing, and even more so once the experiences have been logged into memory over time. They run as background programs and experiences that manifest in the child's becoming more calloused and experienced over time, as would a real-world soldier, for example, even though that child has never left the battlefield of the basement in the VR headset. I'm saying all this to say that when memories are experienced existentially, such as in a movie and music, when the characters represent one's in-group or appear empathetic in some way, such as the players on one's sports team or in one's racial group, the experience and memory become one's own. In this sense, I can remember myself being lynched. I was lynched, yeah, in 12 years a slave, in Rosewood, in Django, well, I had to go hand-to-hand -hand combat, fight to the death. I was lynched in Roots. And I'm sure I'll be lynched possibly in Will Smith's upcoming movie. Another slave movie. See, these are innumerable memories that are written in my mind. They occupy the space of particular memories that I have encountered as an individual and I can draw on all the same. This is a source of my anxiety. These memories are the source of anxiety when, as a so-called black man, I'm followed by a squad car. It's the source of anxiety for my father when, as a so-called black boy, I strayed across the wrong side of the railroad tracks during a family reunion in the South. It is a source of memory that caused my baby mama to jokingly say, be careful now with my baby, I know how you drive. It is the same virtual experience shared between us that's make, that makes us both remember and imagine. Nick, thanks. Well, it's time to clean the bookshelf, to mark those things written for our own good and those with false information. Time to run a malware sweep of the hard drive to figure out what has the system so bogged down clear out the advertisements and spyware, things that rob us of our genuine ideas and our energy. As any hacker worth his salt knows, the most effective malware runs in the background, cloaking the bona fide coding as closely as possible so as not to be recognized as hostile or strange. When we take stock of our minds and we clean house, it is surprising how the false narratives of media cloak themselves as virtuous or as making some kind of sense to us. But as with the surreptitious malware, the course of them will lead to incremental perversion of the coding and the system, resulting in the obvious catastrophic crash. My baby made it home safely because I'm a responsible driver. In reality, regardless of the false memories that the world harbors for her daddy. One day, every day, she will have to decide which memories are real and which ones are false. Of me, of her, of us, as all our children must. Let us be the writers, in part for now, in whole eventually, of the volumes that make our pages of life. Think about it.